think so. No, hi. Not in real life. I'm like a huge fan though. I'm like <laughs> a major fan. So that's why I'm kind of like. <laughs> as it, as it <laughs> Such a pleasure to meet you. Such a pleasure to meet you. Yes. Good morning. I apologize. Everybody. I apologize for my glasses. They're tinted. And so because of the sun, it's tinting them. So I apologize if, you know. They look great. Okay. okay, I think I know what I'm doing now. It's hard to it's hard to tell. Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, Opera Louisiana's conversation with artists today. Um, I really appreciate all of you who are joining us on YouTube, and this is our first time doing this. Um, so I am going to record this meeting. I said I was going to do that, and hold on, there's so many things happening. Okay, um, so I. I just want to say thank you so much to our artists who have um, agreed to join us today. Uh, during this time, um, you know, we were just talking before we came on live that uh, we really have an opportunity now. And um, this is a conversation that should have happened a long time ago, but now we're going to take this opportunity to have it. And it's, it's an important one. You know, opera is, as we posted earlier, not just about beauty but it is about providing a place for people to have an emotional experience and to um, you know, come together in a place where everyone should feel welcome. And so we wanna start by having a conversation and today I plan to do a lot of listening and I look forward to um, you know, hearing what our artists have to say and so I'm gonna very briefly introduce those artists and then give them a chance to, to share their thoughts um, during this time in reaction to you know, what has been going on in our world socially, um, what's been going on in the world of opera, uh, what's meaningful to them right now. And so today uh, we have with us, we're joined by soprano Dara Ramming and she's in Maryland. And we're joined by countertenor Patrick Daly, who I believe is in Tennessee. And we're also joined by Hope Briggs, who got up so early this morning to join us all the way from the West Coast. Um, we're also joined by our artistic director, Michael Borowitz, and our associate director, Sianella Agassi. And we'll hear more from them later. So we're going to start this morning um, just by hearing from the artists. I've asked each of them to, to share with us a two-minute statement. Um, and I've left this really up to them, um, what they want to say. And again, I feel like our job today is to listen. And so now, uh, Dara, if you don't mind, I'm gonna ask you to begin. Okay, uh, while I did not prepare <laughs> a, a, a statement, um, I, I'm just uh, happy uh, to be um, able to have a conversation uh, with, with people in the arts uh, regarding, um, uh, regarding uh, expressing what it is that we've been um, dealing with um, in our nation and in the world. Uh, the things that are happening today aren't new, but the fact that we are talking about it right now, that's new. And, um, and hopefully that will um, give us an opportunity to move forward in a way that's mindful and, um, and conscious. And, and so, um, so I'm very happy about that. So, um, so that's, that's really all I have to say in starting, but I'm also very happy to be a part of this conversation. And I hope that we all um, share um, our experiences and, and share what it is that, um, uh, what it is that we feel that we can do to make this world better. So that's my contribution at the beginning. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dara. Um, Patrick, I'm gonna ask if you would go next. Mute yourself first, Patrick. Um, you know, again, uh, this is uh, to, to say what, to kind of piggyback off of Dara was saying, um, really, really grateful to be a part of this conversation. As I was saying in an email, I think to Leanne, like, I was like, I thought I missed something, but um, this particular company just means a lot to me, uh, just because, you know, of the people, really, it's the people who are there, uh, you all working there, and have always just been really kind and generous and supportive. And so, you know, to aid 
this company, but also other companies and other organizations and the entire um, industry in some way is really important, right? Um, as Dara said, none of this happening now is new. Um, this is something that many of us feel day to day. I mean, I was driving, I've been, you know, whenever I drive, I'm feeling things. If I, if a cop car is even behind me and they may not even be, be coming for me, but I, I get tense and nervous, right? But now it's all out in the open and everyone is now engaged. Everyone is being sort of pushed into having a conversation about something. And so we don't want to just have the conversation to have the conversation for, for conversation's sake. We want to have the conversation so that there is real systemic change. Yes, as a society, yes, as a nation, but also as an industry so that we make this art form so much more equitable for everybody. It, I, as I say sometimes to my colleagues in other spaces, it's got to reach the hood. If it doesn't reach the hood, if it doesn't help the hood, then what's the point? I don't care how high and beautiful it is. It has to reach everybody. And that's what our art form really should do. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, Hope, I'll turn it over to you. Hope, just a reminder to unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I did prepare a little something and then I'll just add a little extra, but I just wrote that I'm heartbroken that there is such racism and the inability to celebrate our differences. And I think that it's sad that people make judgments solely based on the color of someone's skin. It's unimaginable. And I'm glad that there are global, that there's a global outcry and that discussions are happening all over the world. And I'm really happy to be a part of this one. And I'm really appreciative to you guys to give us this time to voice our concerns and our opinions. And um, what I will say is that, um, I've been receiving several emails and just notes from different colleagues and accompanists and different people that I've worked with, just expressing their love and appreciation uh, for me. You know, um, some of my colleagues who are Caucasian, they just said, I just want you to know I love you, I appreciate you, and that's just meant the world to me. And I'm glad that we're having this discussion. I pray that the dialogue continues. And um, what I will say is that. I, I kind of was, was raised in a household in an environment where um, we celebrated ethnicities. And when I came into classical music, even though it was new to me and I didn't have experience in that, I was uh, raised in a, a very um, artistic house, starting you know with ballet and tap and all of that when I was three and four years old. And when I came to classical music, even though I didn't see a lot of people at that time um, who were African-American, I, I was kind of nurtured and given the, the support that I had a place in this art form. Uh, and it was when I saw people like Miss Battle and Miss Norman that I saw people that I could identify with and I had the courage to, to go for it. But what I will say is there are some times when I did feel like an out cider and I did feel like people misunderstood me and made judgments on my character and my taste and my personality based solely on the color of my skin and that was disappointing but I was really happy when I had the opportunity to show them that we have more in common than you know we're more alike than we are unalike. And so again, I'm just really happy to have this opportunity to just bring this to the forefront and for us just to discover our commonalities. Thank you so much, Hope. Um, that's just, it's so well said. And I think I think that's it. We, we do need to find our commonalities, but we can't find those if our judgments and our stereotypes and, um, you know, our, our racism gets in the way. And I think that's the important thing that we really have to own up to. Um, and es especially in our, in our field, um, I, it's so important because what we're claiming to do is to bring opportunities for people to have these emotional experiences. And these should be experiences you know, everyone, every person experiences the same emotions. We might express them differently, 
But as you're saying, we have all of that in common and it's something that we should all be able to share. Um, you know, at this point, um, one of the things that both uh, Dara and Patrick um, talked about was that, you know, this is not a new problem. Um, and it's a problem that should have been talked about ongoing for the for many years. And so I'm going to pass, uh, I'm going to pass the, the show over to the conversation over to Michael um, to talk a little bit about um, Ulysses and what where that was, where that came from, what prompted him um, to create that production and to um, take us back a little bit to his thought process in, in creating that production. Leanne, do you mind if I talk a little bit about Butterfly as well? I would love for you to talk about Butterfly, yes. You know, because that's sort of where it all started. You know, I, uh, um, I had the great uh, fortune to have Hope um, come in very last minute for an Aida uh, that I was doing. And, um, you know, I didn't know her, but her reputation was, was um, really something else. And she came in and, and sang so beautifully and was such an amazing colleague that there was no question for me when we were deciding um, in 2015 about, and I think you remember we were sort of talking about um, butterflies, possible butterflies, I said, you know, I, I know the person who would sing this so beautifully. And I knew though in the process that it was going to be a, a little bit of a uh, walk uphill for us. Um, because, uh, you know, moving to the South uh, from New York uh, was a great thing for me. And I love being here in Baton Rouge. Um, I do not enjoy the, uh, the level of racism that I encounter um, on a daily basis here. Um, and I think it's important for us. And I thought it was important for us in 2015 to take a chance and um, sort of press some buttons, if it were. And, um, you know, Hope did such a beautiful job in that production. We had Chauncey Packer as her Pinkerton. Um, and I couldn't have asked for better colleagues or more um, brilliant musical experience. We we had a few comments about um, casting Hope and Chauncey in those roles. And um, what, I, what I continued to say to those people is, if it made you feel uncomfortable, that's a good thing. It means that you're thinking, you're aware of what your perceptions are in our art form. And even though all of these things come from Europe, uh, that we that we prize so so highly, um, our art form is constantly changing. We're never going to stop doing butterflies or bohems, but it doesn't mean that we can't cast them with beautiful voices. And uh, I was glad that we did that, and that got us started um, into thinking then about our um, anniversary season, 2017. And we wanted to do something uh, special. And I had um, fallen in love with Monteverdi's uh, Ritorno d'Ulisse in Patria um, years ago when I was at Cleveland Institute of Music at Lyric Opera Cleveland. And they did a fantastic production. Uh, Benton Hess um, reorchestrated it and conducted. And it was just uh, glorious from beginning to end. And I love the story of a man who is um, beaten down by situations and circumstances and who finds a way to make his way back to his love and to the world in, in general. And so when we were talking about um, doing something special for 2017, I really wanted to take a look at um, Ulysses and tell it in a, in a, in a way that was not European. Um, that was not connected to uh, theorbos and lutes and harpsichords, but that used uh, the colors of the instruments that I had been um, really having my eyes open to here in the South, especially. You know, there's such a, um, a huge church music um, uh, community here. And the musicians who, uh, the artists who make that happen every week are some of the greatest musicians I've ever known. So I, I thought, let's give it a try. We'll sing it in Italian. We'll tell the story in its original language. 
but we'll give it a, a little extra dose of um, Southern, Southern Baptist, if it were. And, you know, when I brought it up to um, all of the, these folks that um, were uh, coming to sing, you know, Patrick, I didn't know Patrick until I had talked with Susan Eichhorn Young, and I said, I, I need a really great <laughs> counterfeiter. And she turned me on to, to Patrick, and um, I'm so grateful for that. And Dara, Dara had auditioned for us before, and I mean, such a glorious voice, and that voice of a goddess fit perfectly into that role of Minerva. So, um, you know, when I brought this uh, idea up to them, almost everybody um, was skeptical and um, didn't really um, understand, I think, sort of where I was trying to go with it. But the fact that Bill Shomos, who was our stage director, um, said it in, um, in the South um, during some civil unrest uh, made it that much more um, believable and relatable um, for me uh, as well, and I think for many in our audience. And so it was, uh, again, it was another walk uphill for us, um, but I think our audiences were um, moved in many different ways. And uh, I want us to continue to do things like that, and I, I make a promise that we will continue to do that. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I appreciate you sharing so much, especially for those of you who are watching who may not know those um, know those shows or know the history of those productions. Um, I just want to take a few minutes and and let our artists, you know, respond to to your comments. But also, I would add on to that that as you said, it, it, those productions stirred some questions in our audience, and they started some conversations that needed to be had and. Um, what I see over and over is that when we push those limits, that's when our audience grows, that's when our audience becomes more complex. And I don't mean just diverse as in the people attending, but I mean as in the conversations that are had, how people buy into it, um, they, they really have a stake in, in what's happening. And I think, again, that, that is what our art form is meant to do, not just to be beautiful music, but to be a place to start conversations and to inspire people. So I'm gonna open it up um, for any of you artists who want to respond or talk about your experience in those productions at all at this point. Leanne, can I, can I just jump in really quickly and add that we are very lucky that we have the board of directors that we have um, who uh, support us and who um, understand that we can get a little out there sometimes but they're willing to take those chances with us and, and they've been taking those chances with us for years and, and I'm very supportive and, and very grateful for them. It's a very good point. Thank you, Michael, for, um, for, for making that point. Okay, I'm gonna open this up to, to our artists and, and to share about, again, their experiences with those productions um, or reactions. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Okay, hi, I'll go first. Um, regarding Butterfly, it was my first Butterfly. I was thrilled to have that opportunity. And um, I guess for me, I, I knew obviously that pay, playing Butterfly might be a little different for some people to see an African-American uh, singing Cho Cho San, but I have to say, I did feel that there was perhaps some acceptance because of famous predecessors like Leontine Price, who sang the role beautifully, uh, Leona Mitchell, uh, Michelle Kreider, I believe had sung it. So I felt that um, that there was already a kind of a universal acceptance of someone African-American in a role. But now that I think about it, I don't know of very many African-Americans who have stepped into the role. I don't know, and right, how long has it been? And I do recall that um, my agent had told me, um, I think it was before, yeah, it must've been before I did it with you guys. Um, it was a great role, but he said, you know, they're just hiring Asian singers to sing it. So he's like, you can sing it beautifully, but you know, they're going to want an Asian singer, so don't even go there. So, um, you know, my hope is that 
audiences can embrace the idea of having someone sing that role who is not necessarily Asian, just as they accept people singing all types of roles who might not necessarily, necessarily come from that ethnic background, but for some reason they're able to push past. And so my hope is that um, that can change, um, you know, but I had a wonderful, wonderful time. And I thank you so much for casting, not only me, but Chauncey, the two of us sing the leads and it was an amazing, amazing experience. And um, yeah. Hope, so, Hope, do you feel like, you. do you feel that that is getting better at all? I mean, can you give me a sense of incrementally how, how, um, audiences are um, more willing to accept that. I mean, does it feel different to you at all? I, I do feel that it's different um, in the fact that I feel like now we're having, you know, a lot of African Americans getting opportunities to sing lead roles everywhere, which is awesome, like at La Scala and the Met and just everywhere, you know, A House is everywhere. What I will say is when I did. Um, Dr. Faust in San Francisco Opera, yet you know, I was the only female in the whole opera. I think they're like 20 characters or something. They're all men. I'm the only female voice that's heard in the opera. And so what, what was kind of sad when I discovered, but also kind of a weight on my shoulders too, I found out that I was like the first soprano who had sung a lead role in that opera house in years, in years. So the fact that I had that role, it was given that amazing opportunity was a big deal. And I didn't realize it. And I said, wow, that's awfully sad. You know, they, you know, that that other Sopranos had not had that opportunity. Now since then, we've had, you know, we've had the great fortune of having a lot of great African American singers um, sing at San Francisco. And uh, for instance, I think what was wonderful was the production of uh, The Marriage of Figaro, which was just done last season. We had a Countess of Figaro and a Susanna who were all African-American and they did, they just knocked it out of the park. So I do, I do feel that it's changing, but again, there's still room for improvement. And one thing that I will say also that kind of broke my heart, I was um, reading someone's post on Facebook um, and she sings at one of the European houses and she was told that um, they were hiring too many African-American singers you know, that I, I don't know if the audience was complaining or the board or who, but I just thought, wow, that's so sad that we live in a world where there's only a certain, there's only a certain quota and you can't go past that, you know? So I really hope that, you know, we can have more experiences like Butterfly, where you're seeing two African-American leads or San Francisco or Opera San Jose that gave me a, an opportunity to do an uh, opera where there were four of us who were African in America, singing leads in an opera. So, you know, glad we're having this conversation. Um, can I piggyback a little on what Hope just said? Uh, um, a part of also um, what we experience as African American um, opera singers is that we're also um, involved in shows in black shows or um, shows, you know, uh, the Porgy and Bess, which I love. I absolutely love Porgy and Bess um, and Trimanisha. And, um, and so it, it is uh, unfortunately um, the case that uh, many opera companies aren't as comfortable in inviting um, a great artists, uh, you know, uh, uh, black um, or uh, African-American or African, African descent um, opera singers who um, to sing the, the traditional roles, um, uh, the Verdi and the Puccini and the Mozart and that kind of thing. Uh, but, uh, but that, you know, but that is just a fact of a part of um, what we deal with as, um, as musicians, uh, even though we've had the same training as our counterparts. Um, I absolutely enjoyed my time working on um, the, the Ulysses uh, with uh, uh, Opera Louisiane. Uh, it, was a, it was a lot of fun and very unique for me because I never thought anyone would have ever hired me to sing Monteverdi. Um, I just, you know, that, that just wasn't a thing. I, I didn't think it. So, so in my mind, that was already, you know, a big uh, 
difference than than my experience. And so I I, I love the the um, chance. Um, Michael and on Leanne that you guys took just to even go in that direction um, with the voices you chose um, for the show. And so that was um, that was exciting um, for me and um, and a lot of fun. It was hard. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. It was hard because it was, um, you know, it wasn't Puccini. It wasn't Verdi. And so to me, that's easy music. Monteverdi was a whole other monster. And um, and so so that was, you know, and that's great. It's always it's wonderful to be challenged and it's wonderful to sing new music. It was new to me. It's not so new, though. Um, but another thing that was going on in Baton Rouge at the time, it was a year after what had happened to Alton Sterling. And so, um, and I think at the time that we were doing the show, um, the, the city was waiting to hear back from the um, courts regarding uh, what was gonna happen to the police officers that, um, that, 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 that killed Alton Sterling. And so, you know, so that was also, um, you know, an interesting time in the city, I thought. Uh, and, and so I was very mindful um, while I was there. And um, as I walked the streets of Baton Rouge, which I tend to do every, in any city that I work in, I find myself, you know, walking around and, you know, seeing what I can see and, you know, and talking to the people and that kind of thing. Um, that was just a, a, a great time um, to, um, to be doing this particular opera with the choices um, that the artistic um, team made for the show, uh, you know, with Minerva being um, like a defense lawyer, uh, you know, but black power and I had my Afro wig and all of that. That was just very interesting. Um, and I think opera needs to take chances and, and do things differently. Um, and sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. I thought this one worked. Um, we had some, we had that one interesting performance with a guy from this walked in uh, onto the stage from the street. We shouldn't have that experience again. But um, overall, it was just, you know, really, really interesting. And, um, and I, I'm, I was very happy to do that, because that was so different than anything that I'd ever done in my career. So, so thank you. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, uh, that guy walked on during the performance, and we didn't even know it. Um, doing that production was so much fun. Um, so as a countertenor, I do tend to sing a lot of early music. And so, you know, classical music overall is very white. Opera can some, and I think, and there's, and you know, it all fluctuates at different times, but you know, opera can be whiter or, you know, just as white. And then early music is even whiter than that. Um, so it's just like, you know, and, and then those conversations are weird. You know, they're like, oh, um, you know, the like, and you hear things like, oh, the color, we can you pull some of the color back? on your sound. I mean, I've gotten that. I've heard that many times um, in early music spaces. But to sing Monteverdi, and I think when I when Michael first sent the score and all and all the MIDI tracks, I was going through it, I was like, okay, um, this is not in what I know of early music and that style, but I know it's with gospel and jazz orchestration and this style, which I'm also, which I'm very at home with. I'm a I'm a, I'm a Nashvillian, I'm a church boy, like it is like that's that's right up my alley. So getting into the space finally with the singers, finally with everything, and I was like, oh, this felt right. Um, it felt really comfortable. And it also was nice again to sing early music, but with this um infusion of uh of styles that are very much familiar to the community in which you're in and the community in which some many of your artists come from. Um was such a freeing experience. The production itself, um, there were five of us. There were five African-American singers. We took a picture and we kind of, I think one time it was myself, Dara, Ivan, uh, Nathan, and Tamara, we all kind of looked around, I was like, oh, this is happening. And it's not Porgy. <laughs> That's really dope. <laughs> Well, I will, I will say just really quickly, just to interrupt, you know, Afton Battle, her, her name was brought up uh, the other day at the Opera America conference, so I'm, I'm going to call her out again yet. And I love Afton. And uh, she commented on one of those photos and said, there's a, there's a lot of beautiful color in that photo. And, and it made me sad. It just, it, it actually made me sad that, that that was not the norm. And it isn't always the norm. I think we took a big picture, like, we can't believe this was kind of a thing. And, and it wasn't just 
you know, the African-American singers that were very connected and got to hang out and do things together, everyone was very engaged with each other. We really, you know, built some really long lasting friendships and relationships. Um, you know, I still call at least uh, quality off the, you know, my mom, like I'll text her or on Facebook, hi mom. And she's like, hi son. And this, you know, we're still very connected um, in, in those really amazing ways. So that production, you know, opened up a lot and, you know, and, and being able to sort of be, you know, free in some ways in Baton Rouge and really get to take in the community um, was really awesome. I just, I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. I did. And I love, you know, the risk. I, and up to, to that point too, you know, of course, being set in the South, right? Um, post-war, but going into, uh, but also like uh, Black Power Movement, you know, uh, there's the, uh, there's, you know, Woodstock and all of that. And so, and here I am as the son of Ulysses and, and his wife, and, and they're not, and, and they're not of the same race. And so here I am the biracial son of them, but I, I'm all out. I got to hit, you know, I'm smoking a joint for the first time. Um, <laughs> you know, um, coming down and doing some things that just really pushed and were fun, um, but also made you think and made us all, we all, and I think all of the characters even had an arc. There was even, the, no matter what the degree in which you were playing, all of the characters had some sort of arc. There was dimension to all of them. And, you know, you, and everybody was just so intentional about ensuring that every person felt like a person as an artist as a role and all of that so yeah you know that's um i appreciate you saying that patrick and and michael talking about our board you know and this is by no means do i want this conversation to be look how great opera louisiana is doing um because there's so much work to be done um right. but but i i want to say that i i do appreciate that you know and and i actually had talked to ivan the other day i should have said at the beginning of this conversation um Ivan is under the weather and not able to join us today. Um, we hope to talk to him in, at one of these future conversations. But, you know, um, I was sharing with him that the, the conversations that the board had leading up to Ulysses, when we presented this idea to them, there was a lot of concern. And as Dara mentioned, um, you know, it was the time of the Alton Sterling decision. It was about to come out. Um, and we decided to have more, you know, security at the productions. And, but that was, that was because they, the, the, the patrons and the board were concerned that there were going to be protests downtown uh, where the production was taking place. And then, as you all mentioned, it turned out, you know, the security we needed was backstage from the man wandering on stage from, you know, and from who knows where. Um, anyway, I'm so glad someone caught that on, on tape. And there was, you know, there was no need for that. But, but the, um, the great thing that came out of that were some really really honest conversations with our board. You know, so many times a board meeting um, would be, here's Leanne presenting the information and, and in general, everybody agrees. And I mean, we had a, we have a great board. We've, we've had a great board and during that time we did too. Um, but this was a real opportunity for us to have some conversations and it's led us to a place we are today where I feel like those conversations are even more honest and respectful. Um, and one of the things I want to I want to mention about I appreciate from Patrick is that when you were here, Patrick, I remember you um, went to Southern. I believe it was it was to Southern. You went there and and you made that connection to go and visit with singers and musicians there. And um, it wasn't just look, Patrick is here in town, and we're having this production where we're using all these incredible African American singers. But you went and actually made that connection in the community and that's the place where I feel like we need to learn the most about um, how we grow and not just saying we have this production and we really want you to come and look where we're putting African Americans on the stage but no it's it's got to be a place that that people of all races feel um, comfortable to come and so I just want to thank you Patrick for being such a good example and leader of how how to do that. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, if I could just like pop in there on that really quickly. Of course. Um, I, and, and again, back going back to that production, three of the five African-American singers were also HBCU, historically Black College University graduates. Mm -hmm. Morgan State University, Dara uh, Xavier, 
uh, and uh, Xavier University in New Orleans, and Ivan actually is an alumna, uh, alumnus of Southern. So I'm very intentional, and there are a couple of things about that too. For me, because I'm an HBCU graduate and my coming to classical singing, coming to opera, stems from HBCUs, it stems from the Fifth Jubilee Singers, it stems from, you know, Black church and community. I'm very, very passionate about that. And I teach at one now, Tennessee State University. So I do understand that, and, and there was an article that came out years ago, I think it was still an undergrad, and it was like, where are all the Black singers? And, <laughs> and people are looking for the Black singers, purely like in conservatory and in the PWI spaces. And it's like, there are a hundred, well now about 101 HBCUs. Many of them have, most have vocal programs and have very quality talent. The issue is that a lot of our schools, state or private, do not get the, um, do not get the resources, do not get the connections and the relationships. Um, there's maybe one or two people on the voice faculty, right? Um, and, and, and that doesn't always allow for having faculty that, are, that, that, that work that are working artists that are able to bring in people that have that they have relationships and if they have relationships they may be from you know years gone by and it's so so it, it's it really gets very difficult because also what you're seeing with HBCUs is that you're tr a lot of our students that are coming in yes they can come from great places at Morgan and other schools we've had we came from performing our schools but they also came straight up off the street they came right from the church they came you know not having the experiences that we expect in a conservatory you know oh they should have already been studying they should already know piano they should already know this they don't always have that knowledge so we're starting them from from the go and it's very important that you know, and I take it as a personal thing to make sure I don't care what city I'm in, if there's an HBCU or if there is a high school or a program that has, you know, really wonderful young black talent that I go there and build a relationship or make something happen. Um, talk to them, masterclass, you know, build whatever. Just let them know that they can do this and also, you know, get the conversation started in other ways. So, you know, I want to sing, but maybe I don't want to sing. Maybe I want to do administration. Do I have, does opera own, is opera only this? And I can say, no, opera isn't only, you know, those shows. Opera can also be whatever you decide to make it. If you go into another direction, right? Um, so, and, and the same thing, even with the black church, I usually try and I didn't get to do it with these productions uh, when I've been there, but, you know, I usually even try just to go to a church. I jumped because you know, black musician world is so small. We often end up all knowing each other in some way. And I may make a phone call and say, hey, who's the minister of music at such and such? And I'll go somewhere and sing. And because I'm there, there often are people who will also come to that production again, because there's a relationship um, that's being made. So, you know, those are just spaces I'm passionate about, but there's also spaces where we have more audience, we have more support, but we have amazing talent um, musically, vocally, administratively, all of that. Yeah. I want to um, I want to bring into the conversation now our associate director, Sinella Agassi, um, to talk a little bit about just what you've brought up, um, Patrick, about administration, musicians in other positions. Because um, I know that um, at least you and Dara are uh, also teachers and um, and I want to give Sinella to talk uh, an opportunity to talk a little bit about that um, about it, how it is to be a performer, but then also to have another opportunity or job in the world um, and, and how it's different and how you're potentially uh, viewed differently as a singer versus administration, um, administrator. Sinella. Thank you, Leanne. Um, I personally believe in power of storytelling. So I'm so uh, grateful for all of you being here, sharing your stories and um, experiences. Uh, but as um, I wanna mention today, we are here for uh, to show our support to all the community, all people from people and artists from different backgrounds, but especially during this time for our African-American uh, artists. But uh, I wanna say that to some extent I can relate because as a first generation immigrant being from Middle East as an Assyrian Iranian minority, I also face uh, racism, unfortunately on a daily basis. 
And uh, during the last few days, what has been the most on my mind is that I, I hope that this is not going to be a symbolic diversity what comes out of this, because uh, what I have struggled as an educator, as a violinist and uh, administration is that there are waves come and there are during certain days, certain weeks that I personally have been cheered on. I have been celebrated. My accomplishments have been shared on social media from certain organizations, from certain people to show that they are diverse. But when that passes, uh, then we come back to even the same organizations, same people are afraid and concerned about uh, sharing where I'm from, the country of my origin, when it comes to it. So this shows that the real change has not happened and this is all um, symbolic in a wave that comes and goes. And uh, this has been something that is mostly on my mind for the last few days. And uh, what I would like to ask you is that as artists, uh, what, what are you doing? Because even in hierarchy, I understand that artists fall kind of um, on the weaker side, maybe um, in the bottom side of that chart. But when unified together, I think it can, because organizations cannot operate without artists. So when, when unified together, I think uh, we can all have a great voice. And also, uh, if any of you are willing to share anything specifically on your mind that we as administrators or people who have the power and decision making of who to cast and how to actually make a change as far as diversity. If there's anything on your mind that you would like to share, I would love to hear it. Um, well, I will um, say that um, just on the same lines of what Patrick was saying, you know, I think it is important for companies to, con uh, opera companies, if, if they truly, truly want to be more diverse, uh, they should engage um, the HBCUs and the schools um, within the communities in which that they um, exist, uh, and it, uh, you know, and and and, and uh, make relationships with um, with these universities, with the the teachers and such. Um, it's it's very helpful. Uh, you know, Patrick mentioned that I um, I ta I taught and I also went to Zave University, and you know, I if I had not gone to Zave University and HBCU, I would not be an opera singer today. Had I gone to the University of Miami or um, University of Florida, I think that was the school I was considering going to. Had I gone to there, I guarantee I would not be an opera singer today. But my first day at universe, uh, at Xavier University of Louisiana, um, as a piano major, <laughs> my, um, you know, I, I, I joined the choir and I was told that I had to take voice lessons because it was the rules and you don't always get learn all the rules, but I was told that. And my first voice teacher was Debria Brown, who already had an international, um, a career, um, uh, one of the first black opera singers to sing is um, Carmen at City Opera, you know, and so she was my very first voice teacher. Uh, and if, and if, I, if I had not had the influence of her, who was also a Xavier grad, graduate, um, I would not be an opera singer today. So, um, you know, and, you know, and I just think of the wealth of knowledge that um, that are in our schools and in our universities that aren't are untapped, I guess would be um, the way to say it. Um, you know, there's resources. Uh, and, and, and so I, I think it would be helpful. It would be a mutual thing um, beneficially to both the company and the university. So I think that is um, one way um, that, uh, that companies can do that. And I have seen companies do that. Uh, uh, Michael didn't mention, um, but we also, um, a, a, a large amount of us went to Xavier and did a masterclass. Not, not only the black singers who were a part of that production, but um, several of us went and it was just so great um, for the students to get to sing for the, um, them and for the students had never heard a counter tenor before. Um, I mean, to be truthful, before this production, I'd never sung with a counter tenor. So um, that was exciting. So, so, you know, so we were all learning new things. And so, um, yeah, so, so that kind of thing is, um, is something that will help you get into the community, um, you know, in a way and, and engage people because you'd be surprised how interested people are um, in opera and in the arts um, who aren't necessarily living, you know, in your neighborhood. So um, that, that, that's one, one thing that popped into my mind um, while you were speaking. Um, 
Yeah, uh, if I may too, again, HBCUs, huge, huge platform. Oh my goodness, it had something. Um, you know, there are, oh, this is what I was gonna say. I had a colleague a couple of years ago, uh, we were all hanging out at somewhere and, you know, she's uh, also an HBCU graduate. And she was like, you know, you know, and, and one of the misnomers and one of the, uh, you know, uh, stereotypes is that she said, you know, black people don't support the arts. And I was like, mm, what do you mean? She was like, no, black people don't support the arts. We don't support the arts. And I said, okay, so you gotta take that back. Black people support the arts. Black people support, but black people support the arts or anybody will support the arts that is relevant, that are relevant to them. So if opera is always seen, if we're going to say we're opera singers and opera companies, if, we, if opera is always seen as a museum piece, especially in this country, as you know, always hearkening back to 17, 16, such and such and such and such, when the people who look like us in our communities were not <laughs> allowed to be educated, um, were not, um, were not free, just to be quite blank, uh, quite frank with it, then of course you won't feel like it's relevant. So I won't support it. And it's not, again, it's not just necessarily seeing. I do love an adage of, the, of 100 Black Men of America, really excellent uh, mentoring organization, saying what they see is what they'll be. That's important to see it, but seeing it as in not just sitting there one day, and I think what also happens to and, and a lot of companies do this and a lot of arts organizations across the board. There's always these, you know, elementary school programs for kids, but then they go to middle school. And in middle school is where we lose a lot of students who would have interest in these areas because the arts in many districts and middle schools are cut out. Middle school is where you start to formulate. And then we're expecting them by eighth grade, by the end of eighth grade to go into ninth grade and have an idea. It, many schools will have academies. And it's like, this is where your interest is. Well, they didn't get the proper um, exposure and the proper uh, guidance into something that could be arts related. So they just know the careers that are told within their spaces. So, okay, a doctor, a lawyer, um, you know, a teacher, all of those things, but you go on Sunday morning or you go to an open mic and you hear amazing voices, right? Or you see great um, musicianship and you hear great musicianship or you see what often happens. I have friends all over who do events, right? And they are event managers or production managers for different, um, for different award shows and what have you. Those are people who also could be doing production management and event managing for opera, for classical music but they're gonna run the Stellar Awards, which is a major gospel event or the Trumpet Awards, but they won't necessarily get the shot to do an opera. And I think, you know, if again, we have to really sort of be intentional across the board with investing in communities at an early age, seeing them through, then staying connected. Um, as Dara was saying, you know, building those kind of relationships consistently that they're, hey, we're gonna offer up auditions to your students at a, at, during the school year. Um, we're coming regularly to see you. You have access to me as a director of a company. You, have, you, you can come see me. If you need something, if you have a question, we got you. Because the other thing too, for a lot of our students, there sometimes isn't, um, you know, there's not the same level of understanding of the language. And what I mean by that, not just the singing language, but the language of the business or what is just kind of said. So I remember giving an anecdote. I was with my first young artist company uh, program straight out of Morgan. I'm the first, I'm the only HBCU um, graduate in this program and the only one coming straight from, a, from an HBCU. So I'm straight out of Morgan State. And I learned all of my stuff, I did everything. And then they gave me a scene for the scenes program and said, okay, take it and we'll work on it when you get here. So for everything else, I was told, okay, here's your music, learn it in advance. For this, I was, said, it was, I was told, take it and we'll work on it when you get here. So when I got there, I was like, okay, so we're gonna work on it when I get there. That means I don't have to learn it. We go to the first rehearsal, it's a scene from uh, Orfeo, <laughs> you know, the DJ is going off and I'm sitting here like, beep, 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 uh, trying to read it, right? You didn't learn it, I, I said, you didn't say that. <laughs> you got to tell me you like don't like you like 
you have to say what exactly it is. And sometimes you got to walk through and that's okay. I didn't understand what you meant. No one had said that to me, I, but I, it, I had experienced it before where if they said, take it, learn it, and then we'll work on it. Now I got you. But so those kind of things now that, and, and so because I was the one of the few black people in that space, always feeling like, okay, they're kind of looking at me. I'm being judged, all of those things. And so that made me have to go back, you know, take the night, practice through the night. And I learned the scene, killed it, yes. But <laughs> it was very important that I had would have, if I had known that ahead of time, if I had been prepped. And so making sure that your language and your, um, and your approach is very, it's, it's, uh, it's easily communicated across all folks. Everything is clear. And also then looking at, again, my other part is making sure that there's opportunities in administration. We can put all the people that we want on stage, but uh, as Sanella was saying, oftentimes those artists on stage and in the pit are some of the last on that row and who really needs to be up there are some people from those communities and not just necessarily the most affluent from those communities right not just the most um not just those those from those communities who have money but also who have influence and they may they might be in the hood and if you get you know as some folks would say the ogs who have real relationships you may be able to turn a tide and they'll say you know what, we can trust these people. They really want to see something happen, want to see our students and our community grow in a different way. You know, Leanne, do you mind if I jump in here really quickly? Because um, I, I have a question and it may make us all a little uncomfortable, but this is a very safe space for all of us. And and it's a question that I've, I've um, wanted to, to ask all three of you um, during our time together, but I never really got a chance to. Um, you know, we, I think as, as singers, you're used to being exploited for your voice. Um, that's, that's sort of part of the game that we play. But I'm curious to know from each of you, and we'll start with Hope, um, when you came to uh, the productions that we were doing, I want you to feel comfortable in, in responding if you felt exploited, not just for your voice, but because of the color of your skin. I'm, cu I'm curious about that. Do you mind to answer that question? No, not at all. No, I honestly did not feel exploited um, because of the color of my skin. And for whatever reason, my experience um, in opera, even when I started at school, I didn't, I don't know, I didn't feel exploited. I mean, and I was, I was so used to kind of being the only one, like when I went to Cal State Fullerton, I was the only African-American in the music program at that time. Do you hear me? The only. But for whatever reason, um, I had a very nurturing teacher and the faculty was very nurturing and they really believed in my talent. They looked after me and they supported me. And it actually kind of just trickled down through a lot of my experiences like when I would do different competitions or just different things people would look after me and want want me to be my best self my best performer so uh it helped I think to take off of the weight of I'm African-American I have to prove something because of the color of my skin but I, I really did feel like I had been supported throughout a lot of my experiences so, you know, um, I did, I did not have that experience when I, when I came to uh, Opera Louisiana, really, I just, um, you know, I just wanted to do the best that I could for, for you, give me this opportunity and for all of my colleagues. Um, but no, I, I did not, did not have um, that experience. So, yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, yeah. oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can speak next. I um I haven't um I haven't had that experience. Um I, I also uh, uh well not at Opera Louisiana and I, I was I was trying to go back in my brain to think of you know ever having that feeling and um no not that specifically but I have had the feeling of uh <laughs> um you're here now and you better do what we 
got you here to do. And um, that's not unique to the African American experience. Um, that's I think all of us feel that way when we start a show. Um, uh, but I feel the pressure for myself is harder because it's like, okay, and if you do not do well, um, the person after you, the next uh, person, you know, like me, that uh, won't get the opportunity because remember what that girl Dara did? She, you know, she she messed up that opportunity. They 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 may all mess up the opportunity. So so the 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 um the desire to really excel and go above and beyond and really just you know blow it out of the park or I don't know what the saying is, I'm not a sports person, but to really just do it, you know, where people are like, wow, you know, are there more like her out there? Um, that's the feeling um, that I get um, for every show that I do, <laughs> you know, um, and that and that is a self in self, uh, that, that's something that perhaps I put on myself more than what's necessarily coming from the people that have employed me, but it's definitely there. Yeah, that's I, I'm agreeing with everything that both of these brilliant uh, black women are saying, um, and that's a great question too, Michael. Because for this, so I'll say this: like for this particular production, um, it definitely never felt like it was a, a, an exploitative situation. Any other time I've been at, I've been with the company. Um, in fact, I saw it as necessary, right? Because of the, how the story was being built. It was like, well, yeah, you you do kind of need someone like me. Um, and I think that in a sense, it's nice. I, I kind of think about Miss Price in two ways. I think about Miss Price a lot, but I'm thinking about Miss <laughs> Price in two ways, you know, you know, one of her quotes said, you know, be be black, be be the best, be and shine and do all of those things. Yes, you know, not thinking down about being black, right? But then I also think, you know, about when she talked about singing Aida and how it just felt really comfortable because she was like, she was still a queen. She was still a princess. You know, it, you know, the first time that she didn't have to, it, it was not necessary to change the uh, makeup for her skin. It just, she could be it, right? And those opportunities other than Porgy and Bess or Trumanisha, which are, which are shows that I couldn't be in. I've done, I've, I've done Sport Life in uh, concert, but you know, those opportunities don't always exist to just kind of walk in and who you are is a part of the role and it feels so comfortable and all and, you know those kind of things um you know but there are times that you do feel um there's an old adage that is often said within the black community with uh, uh within what we call the talented 10 hbcus um two adages uh you have to be half as good uh you have to be twice as good to get half as far um you have to be 110 percent better and so, and, and that just comes from, you know, it doesn't matter how educated you are, where you went to school, you know, you could have gone to the, the greatest conservatory in the entire world, the greatest, you know, institution or what they regard as the greatest institution, because that's all relative, right? Um, and still, when you are done with that, still feel like, hmm, okay, I have to prove myself consistently and constantly. And, you know, fortunately, that doesn't always happen, but that does, that is a, that is a thing that a lot of uh, just Black professionals in general carry. And we may not even realize we're carrying it, but we're carrying that feeling of, yeah, you know, I got to make sure to do this because, you know, they, they're going to say this. So I can't, you know, even how you walk into a rehearsal room. And I'm, I wanted to give this anecdote because, mm -hmm. again, one of the reasons why I, I, I was so happy to do this is because, again, I appreciate this company. So <clears throat> I wear shirts like this all the time. Black Men in Opera, HBCU grad, if it's Black power and beauty and what have you, I'm wearing it all the time. I love this kind of stuff. And... Um, I came in one day to the rehearsal space and uh, and I was I had on my this yellow historically it said historically black in kente letters from an HBCU company and it was really beautiful and it of course it's like bright in the room I come into the rehearsal space and Michael looks up and was like oh my god I love that <laughs> can I get one <laughs> it's like I don't think I can I don't think I can wear it but I want it and I was like and you know and that kind of thing 
just acknowledging, you know, what I value and what we value and what's important was so freeing. Because at that, because that, also I'm the one of the youngest people in the cast too. So I'm young and I'm black and I'm like, okay, all right, I gotta do this, right? But being able to sort of come in and have your whole self be appreciated changes the entire game. It just changes the, it changes your feel for everything. So yeah, I mean, those are things that we do feel that, you know, but it's not, but I see it almost as a badge of honor you know, to be able to carry the legacy of the other singers, of those artists, of my ancestors, of those folks. Um, and so I, I tend, I make the energy work for me as opposed to making it feel like a weight. Thank you all um, so much uh, for sharing those, those responses and Sinella for that very insightful um, question. You know, one of the things that we've talked about recently and what we talk about constantly is about our board and the diversity on our board. And currently we have one African-American woman um, who serves on our board of directors and um, she has been our board chair. And she's also, um, she's an incredible, uh, incredible person. Um, she works for many other nonprofits as well. Um, but that's, that's an issue that that we only have one African-American on our board. And it's an issue that I feel like we have tried to confront, but in the light of this conversation and also in recent, mm -hmm. uh, the conference with Opera America this past week, um, it's become clear to me that our efforts have, have been obviously not enough because um, I, I know that we've had comments like, well, if someone is interested, then they will, you know, they'll come to our board. But that's, if it's not a place that feels open and welcoming and that we aren't making the effort to say, we want to get to know you. We mm -hmm. want to know what, you know, what you can bring to our board that's unique and that's you and not what fits into this pigeonhole of what we have as an ideal uh, board member. I, I think there's no way for us to understand um, what what we're missing because because we haven't been open to that and so that's yeah. something that I feel like we we as a as an organization you know really need to confront um, moving forward is to really commit to making sure that um, we're we are looking for for board members from all different um, races and nationalities and I think that's 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 so important um, because like Patrick was talking um, and all of you have said, you know, you see African-Americans on stage, but you don't always see them in the role of director or of, you know, administrator. Um, and so I, I just appreciate you all bringing, bringing that to, to light for me today. I wanna I take this um, chance now to, um, to go back to uh, Sinella for just a moment. Um, and then I want to want you all to have an opportunity to to talk also. Um, Sinella, you mentioned about um, some of the challenges that that you have faced um, as a musician and administrator as well. Um, would you mind sharing a little bit more about uh, about that? And then I would like to ask the rest of the panel to talk about how you feel uh, how you feel you're viewed differently when you're known as a musician. And as when you are just you, an African-American walking down the street. Um, as far as for me, I can say that when I'm going to a performance place, when I'm going as a musician, just inside that pit, inside on that stage, because I'm gathered, surrounded with other musicians and artists in general, uh, we are always more open and and uh, we are uh, di accept diversity and we see the beauty of diversity and art. If not, we wouldn't be there. But as arts administrator, trying to prove that point of view, trying to say that uh, it has value and it's actually, it needs to happen from inside of an organization. It's not just the number of these many, um, you know, African-American artists we have or, um, 
just clicking a box and uh, paperwork that we have to do. So uh, that's something that I have felt that when I'm going to somewhere as a musician, I'm surrounded with love and uh, there is no look at um, where I'm from and uh, what color do I look or how do I speak. But when I'm in the point of an administrator, it's as many of you mentioned, we have to try twice as hard to prove of what we are and just that what I'm speaking is just as valued as uh, anyone else. And it's not just because of where I'm coming from of my culture or anything personal to me. Would anyone else like to um, share about their experience as a musician as opposed to um, when they're not known as a musician? And uh, again, this is a safe, open place. And if it's not something you want to share, um, it's totally fine too. Yeah, I'll go first. Uh, so my experience has been um, just across the board when people might meet me the first time they might have a certain perception, right? And number one, when they find out that, um, for instance, I like a lot of classical movies even, right? You know, I love the independent films. It's like, oh, oh, okay, wow. You know, <laughs> um, but then when, when I'm out in public and uh, someone is introducing me and they find out that I sing, the first thing, a lot many times oh oh so do you sing do you sing gospel that's the first thing right they always assume I sing gospel music or jazz and then when they're like oh she's an opera singer oh and so all of a sudden there is this new level of respect that you've earned right and it almost seems like then people feel like they can discuss other cultural things and things that are you know more highbrow with, with you whereas before they might try to come at a different level um and you know girl you know that kind of stuff like that and then when they find out that you're a classical musician and then you also prove that by you know um communicating your knowledge about you know the different operas and the different singers and just just everything right you know the symphonic works whatever then it's like you've, you've earned the credibility oh okay I see okay you're legit now so that you know I, I've had experiences like, like that yeah okay good I'm, I'm done, done. <laughs> I kept like I was trying to unmute myself and just trouble. Um, <laughs> those are things I I'm gonna give this. I like giving anecdotes. Um, so one of the things. So I also I'm like again I am a singer. I love singing, love performing, but I very proudly teach, and I also do what I can to help other organizations and also build my own organizations and own entities in Nashville and and across the country in different ways. And so. I'm on a couple of boards and a couple of committees in Nashville for some, you know, some fine organizations and, you know, consult with them on different projects and such and may lead a project here or there. And um, when I first go on, get on the board and I'm generally, you know, for, yeah, for one of the boards I'm on for sure, I'm the only black person at all on the board. Not, I'm not the first, but I'm the only one. And when I first get there, I, I'm very intentional about kind of everything, even what I wear, because I wanted to say something, uh, because I don't, again, I like this price says, I don't see it as a stain. I don't see it as anything to fight out of. I see it as a strength. So I'm like, so I'm gonna, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna play with it. I'm gonna play with people's minds. I like to do these social experiments, even with what I wear and how I present. And so, you know, I will wear in the first board meeting or so, you know, I'll wear a nice suit, suit and tie, maybe button up and things and be very pleasant. And hello, how are you? Thank you. You know, what we call cold switching, going back and forth. Um, and that's also a constant thing that many of us do. I think it's a skill. I think it's useful. I, again, I see it as a strength and a power. But then I will, after getting a comfortable, if you will, I will, um, you know, go into the board meeting and now I wear a t-shirt. 
and a fitted baseball cap. Maybe it's to the front, maybe it's in the back. Maybe wear some joggers, maybe wear some tennis shoes. You know, kind of my, the, the look changes um, because oftentimes when we come into these rooms as the African-American in the room, they're saying, we wanna reach out to this community. We wanna be more diverse. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna test you on that because I'm going to look like, for one, I, I, I dress like that anyway. <laughs> but two, I'm looking more like the people that you say you wanna be a part of. So when you when I'm confronted, when you are are you if you're confronted with that look, what does that tell you? Before what you already knew ahead of time was that Patrick has these degrees, Patrick went to these institutions, Patrick does these kind of shows, he has this reputation, you've seen his resume. Does that change when I wear this? Does that change when um, you see this this body and being a especially a black male body? Um, you know, their expectations, you know, it's uh, like I'm a little bit of a bigger guy. So it's like he can be opposing and things like that. And it's like, no, I'm the same person. This is the same exact person that came into the room. Um, you know, I think it was so interesting, even just recently, especially now that all of this has happened, right? Um, where we have seen onslaught back to back to back of Black bodies being just being decimated um that we've seen that we've heard um and 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 even the threat of it right with the christian cooper amy cooper situation in new york everything the tensions change you know so everybody's like oh i'm liberal or i'm comfortable and then you really get to see so another anecdote i went the other day to a grocery store in my in my neighborhood i live in the suburbs and i'm wearing my boston university shirt but i had on a black lives matter hat and I'm also wearing a mask because it's COVID. The looks, because I was already nervous for one, wearing masks and being, I didn't have, when I didn't have the right mask for a while, I, you know, was also, again, very intentional about wearing collegiate gear and things that said, hi, I'm not a threat going into these places. I was, I had to be like that because I didn't want anybody to see me and ha see me covered up where I'm wearing like a bandana mask and say, oh, he's gonna come and get us. So I'm wearing things, my minor was dance. So I was wearing like my Morgan State University dance company things like, hi, I'm an artist. I'm wearing collegiate Boston University, you know, things that people will feel maybe he won't be so bad, right? Um, but, you know, go now, because of where we are, people, and before that, people were generally kind and like, oh, yes, I like your shirt, things like that, you know, because I still wore those things. But this time, I'm going into the store, and, you know, they're like, they, they don't know what to, how to take it. Hold on, he's wearing a mask. We don't know what his face, his facial expression, is he pleasant? Um, the, the hat is Black Lives Matter. Is, is he gonna like be militant and gonna fight? But he's wearing Boston University. I, I, I don't, I, you, you know, you're trying to, they're trying, and you see them battling it out. And I was on the phone with a friend and I was looking like, yeah, I see you try to figure it out. I figure me, I know me. And all of these things can be true. And to the point of what Hope said, you know, I think that the react the responses from different communities about what you do are different. So when I'm with a, in the black community and I'm dressed, you know, more relaxed as I would like to be, and I say, "Hey, yo, I'm an opera singer," and they're like, "Yo, for real, bruh, that's what's up." And like again, because it's people are like that's something that we don't do. It's a it's almost a point of pride for everybody. Like you do that, that's what's up. Like kill it. But then in other communities. Once again, I can dress the same way and we'll say, well, yes, I'm an opera singer. Or especially, especially being in Nashville, being a big college town and you know the institutions we have here. And I said, well, I'll say, well, where did you go to school? I went to Morgan State and in Baltimore HBCU. Okay, cool. And I have a master's from Boston University. Oh, the conversation changes because now I now you respect me because of where I went. And I'm not like them. Um, I'm not one of those people. And it's just, you know, it's something that we juggle a lot personally, professionally. Um, again, that code switching is a very real thing. And oftentimes something that it's taught, um, that we, that is demonstrated, you know, um, it is a weight, but you can shift that, that energy to make it not be such a weight. Um, but I'm so glad that we're now being able to have a conversation to say, 
you know, this is what it is for us. Um, we got to make some changes. And it also should be that we make changes so that what I wear and what I feel like wearing is not going to be such a detriment or feel like such a detriment to the rest of my life. That, that was powerful, <laughs> what you just said, Patrick. Um, I mean, I, I mean, from the cold switching to, um, you know, feeling as if you have to wear something, you know, because you don't want to make the people around you feel uncomfortable. And then we're dealing with COVID and then, um, you know, you have to wear a mask and the fear of, you know, you know, how people are going to feel when you walk into that space um, that um, that really resonated with me. Um, for myself, uh, I feel as if I, uh, when I, um, I, I, in, in circles that aren't necessarily the opera circles that I'm in. And I'm not in the, I feel like I'm not in the opera circles that often. Um, you know, I have those great opportunities when I get to do those wonderful shows and that's great. And I'm amongst, you know, those colleagues. And, you know, otherwise I'm on the tennis court um, playing tennis and people are looking at me like, oh, can she play tennis? Or I'm at church and, you know, and, and, and you know, and, 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 you know, and with my other things that I'm involved with um, and I'm teaching and that kind of thing. Um, and I, I feel as if people look at me, uh, look to me sometimes as a, um, a, an authority, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I just, that's how I carry myself, uh, just a, a, an example. Um, uh, my nephew and I were in a fender bender two days ago and um, it involved three cars. We were not at fault, but um, um, I, I jumped out of the car first and I told my nephew who's a minor to stay in the car because, I, you know, just stay in the car, I'll handle it. And the other, the, the other two drivers, the other two cars, um, one was um, Middle Eastern and the other one was Hispanic. Um, and they both looked to me to say what, to hap what happens next. And I'm like, well, I'm calling 911. And then I told them what 911 said. And then I said, well, we need to do this. And so I felt like I was leading. <laughs> leading what was happening there and and people look and they I felt as if they looked to me and expected that from me and I was happy to to do that you know to to make um what we had to handle um and, and that's what a lot of black women have on their shoulders you know that feeling of um I'm just I'll handle it I'll take care of it I'll do it Whatever it is that needs to be done in order for these things to happen um, the, the way that we need it to happen. So, um, so yeah, um, I do find myself on occasion telling people I, I'm an opera singer, and and they may not know it. Um, and and but I don't necessarily see a huge change in the way that they they speak to me or act towards me. Um, but um, yeah. Yeah, it's just, you know, I, I feel like as if um, people are ready, they, they have their opinions. Um, um, and when, when one is, when, uh, you know, uh, they see me for the first time and, um, and when I eventually say what it is that I do, um, that might confirm in my mind what it is. Uh, so that's my um, response to that. Thank you all uh, so much, and and I just want to say that I'm I'm so sorry for those experiences that that you all have on a daily basis, and um, and I, I think it's so important, and and I appreciate so much that you all are willing to share so openly, because I feel like especially for our patrons and our audience to know that you know many of them know you, uh, you know. That, when you come to do a show at Opera Louisiana, you get to meet a lot of, of the people who come to our shows. And I think that's one of our great strengths is connecting people to artists and, and vice versa. Um, but I think it's important for our audience to know that this is, you know, this happens, this happens to every African American. And it's not just, um, it's, it's not just, it's to the musicians. It's not just to people that they don't know. Um, this is something very real. Uh, that happens um, that happens every day. And so I just appreciate you all being willing to share so openly today. Um, and I, again, this is the first step in a, a ongoing conversation. And I appreciate you all offering your suggestions and um, we're open to listen anytime. Um, and I just wanna, I, I'll say if anyone else has anything else they wanna share today before we close, um, feel free to do that now. All right, well, thank you all again. Um, 
Hope Briggs, Patrick Daly, Dara Ramming, and um, of course our very own Sinella Agassi and Michael Borowitz. Thank you all um, very much. I'm gonna try to put us back all here together again. Um, thank you all so much for being a part of this today. And I really can't appreciate enough um, just the emotional commitment that you all made today and the insight that you've given us. So thank you. Thank you all. Love you guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Uh -huh.